So first of all, Mr. Speaker, how do you weigh the pros and cons of Speaker Pelosi's potential trip to Taiwan? Do you think she should go? Well, I think now that it has become public, she has to go. And I think to back down before the Chinese communist dictatorship would send signals of weakness, would actually embolden Beijing to be more aggressive uh, and would make it look like America can be shoved around. You, you can have one conversation before this became public, although I am the highest ranking American ever to have gone to Taiwan. And I did so uh, in a very direct disagreement with the Beijing government, which nonetheless invited me to come and give speeches in both Shanghai and Beijing <clears throat> with only the requirement that I had to go through Japan to get to Taiwan, that I couldn't fly direct. So I think this is at one level, a lot of noise about nothing. I think the if uh, she holds her ground and if the Biden administration doesn't act uh, timidly uh, and, and almost cowardly, uh, I think everything will be fine. She'll go, it'll be a nice event. I uh, hope she takes a bipartisan delegation. And I saw a note this morning that she had asked some Republicans to go with her. And I think that's a good signal of our support for uh, Taiwan not being occupied or invaded by the People's Republic. As you mentioned, that when the CCP threatened to withdraw your invitation in 1997, you insisted on going to Taiwan. But uh, now China is a very different country now. Do you think your trip is still a good reference for Speaker Pelosi? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, uh, when they got when we said that we were going to go to Taiwan, and they said you can't go to Taiwan, and Gardner Peckham, who was my national security advisor, uh, said very clearly to them that the Chinese dictatorship does not uh, instruct the American speaker on his travel schedule. Uh, and they came back and were tougher. We said, fine, if, if we have to choose between Beijing and, and Taipei, we're gonna skip Beijing. So you know, if, if, if you're that mad, we won't come. At which point they promptly reversed themselves and said, no, no, we want you to come. And then they, then they allowed me to give two very tough speeches about freedom and democracy and you know, the, the rule of law. Uh, speeches which were pretty deviant from the way the dictatorship is run. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the only concession they requested was that we couldn't fly direct from uh, the People's Republic to Taiwan. China is in some ways different and not different. China has been a Leninist dictatorship uh, since the Chinese Communist Party took over. Uh, Mao and, and uh, uh, the, the key leaders all were Leninists. They believe in a centralized hierarchical dictatorship uh, with secret police and with uh, basically as much thought control as they can get over every individual. It's a truly totalitarian system. It was back then, it is now. But are you concerned about China taking some uh, aggressive measures in response to Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan? Because I'm sure you remembered the Taiwan Strait crisis in 1996 is just one year before your visit to China and Taiwan. Uh, and back then, uh, President Clinton uh, responded by sending two aircraft carriers right. to the region. Are you concerned for uh, of China doing something now? And how should U.S. respond? Well, I mean, the Chinese uh, communists in 1996 were making threatening noises uh, and were, I think, at the time, firing missiles and uh, whatever. Uh, I was very publicly supportive of President Clinton sending the two aircraft carriers. I, I'm old enough. I remember the bombardment of uh, Kimoy and Matsu in 1958. And I remember Eisenhower sending uh, ships with nuclear weapons to stand off of China to say, we're not gonna tolerate you invading these two islands. Um, it, it, you have a totalitarian dictatorship with a very deep sense that it ought to be the central kingdom as it was before 1800. Uh, and uh, they're going to push as hard as they can on every front. Uh, and and that's, that's not illegitimate. I mean, it's their right to try to do that. Our job is to make sure that uh, they confront uh, countervailing strength uh, so that they understand that there are limits to what they can get away with. And part of that's just purely psychological. And, and, that, and that's what we were doing in 1996 and 1997. And I was there to say, look, we really believe in freedom. We really believe in the rule of law. We are really prepared to 
you know, on the one hand, Taiwan cannot declare its own independence. On the other hand, you cannot occupy Taiwan. Uh, and uh, I was very clear in meetings with the most senior Chinese leadership. Admiral Jim Stavridis has pointed out that you could turn uh, Taiwan into a porcupine. You could, uh, you could equip it with so many different defensive weapons that the cost of trying to take it would be so prohibitive that uh, the Chinese just wouldn't try it. Had we done that two years ago with Ukraine, there would never have been a Russian attack because it had been too expensive. And I think there's, that's the real lesson we should learn from the disaster in Ukraine. Policy-wise, right, do you think it's time now to update U.S. policy towards Taiwan? Because for the past 40 years, strategic ambiguity has effect effectively avoid war and enabled the U.S. to uphold relations with Taiwan while also develop ties with China. Do you think now is the time to uh, update on that and take a more clear stance? Well, I think we should, and it's very important to make clear that no military effort by the Chinese dictatorship uh, will be tolerated. And that whatever it takes to defeat that military effort would happen. Uh, remember, I mean, Taiwan produces something like 68% of the more advanced chips in the world. Uh, I mean, if, if Taiwan were for some reason knocked out economically, uh, the, the impact worldwide, we think we have a supply chain problem now. You take Taiwan out of the chip manufacturing business, uh, you have a worldwide crisis in virtually every modern system. How do you evaluate on this one China policy? Do you think it served its purpose? And is it now the time for the U.S. to recognize Taiwan's status? Well, I, I, what I really think happened that was tragic is that when Hong Kong was given back to China by Britain, uh, there was hope. And they talked about, you know, two systems in one country. And there was a hope that if they could allow Hong Kong to remain truly free, that that would then become a model by which you could then have Taiwan also become you know, three, three systems in one country. Problem is that the dictatorship cannot stand any zone of freedom. And so they have actually crushed uh, the traditional openness of Hong Kong in ways that have both been economically very expensive and have shattered the traditional culture of Hong Kong. Uh, and so I think what you have now is a situation where uh, why would anybody, the 24 million people living on Taiwan who are prosperous, who are remarkably free, who have real elections, who have a genuine open news media, uh, who can travel all over the world, why would they want to have a Beijing dominated secret police totalitarian state uh, ruin their lives the way they've ruined Hong Kong. And that's the biggest difference. In 96, we had two hopes that turned out to be false. And Claire Christensen and I wrote a book called Trump versus China, where we went into this at some length, uh, because I was one of the people who thought that the uh, opening up of markets was the first step towards freedom. And I was just wrong. And I, I, I actually, it's a bad sign probably about my education, but I actually did not realize that Deng Xiaoping, uh, was one of the first 23 founders of the Chinese Communist Party when he was actually in Paris during World War I. Went back to China through Moscow, spent a year at Lenin University, was a deeply committed Leninist. So when, when Deng Xiaoping makes the Great Southern Tour, which I've always thought was one of the most important events of the last 50 years, and gives these speeches that, that we have to be open to productivity, that I don't care if it's a black cat or a white cat, I care if it catches the rat, et cetera. Like most of our elites, I, I joined in thinking this is the beginning of opening up. Well, it was a profound misunderstanding. What he was actually saying was, we can only keep the dictatorship if we can provide enough prosperity that people don't throw us out. Uh, so it was a pro-dictatorship survival not a modify the dictatorship, which is why Deng Xiaoping is one of the real hardliners at Tiananmen Square, demanding that they kill people. Um, <clears throat> so that's the context. In 96, we were in 97, we were still in a place where we thought there was a genuine possibility that you would see the emergence of a moderate rule of law um, integrated in the world order of Chinese system. Uh, I think now we all know that that's not 
not going to happen in the foreseeable future, that what you have is a totalitarian state. And remember, when, when uh, Khrushchev makes his famous secret speech attacking Stalin, the reaction in Beijing is horrified because they see, they see uh, Khrushchev as the equivalent of Martin Luther launching the Protestant Reformation. They, they don't think this is a great idea. They love Stalin. They still love Stalin. Uh, Xi Jinping is much closer to Stalin and Lenin uh, than he is to George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and so I think we have to take a position. I don't want us to deliberately provoke the Chinese communists. And I think to suggest that uh, Taiwan be admitted to the UN, that the United States will establish a full embassy, et cetera. I think that would push us dangerously close to a genuine confrontation. On the other hand, I do not think an American speaker visiting the island will be anything more than an irritation. Okay. Uh, speaking of now, Xi Jinping is set to be re-elected for an unprecedented third term later this year. And uh, uh, as you know, that so-called reuniting Taiwan with China is one of his major political goals. And how do you think he will change the dynamics between US, China, and Taiwan? Well, I think, look, I think that he is probably very frustrated right now. Uh, COVID has been much more damaging to China than they want to admit. Um, their economy is really slowed down to a degree we haven't seen in 30 years. The unhappiness in the middle class and in rural China is much greater than it has been for, for a generation. Um, and he's watching all of his neighbors gradually organize against him. I mean, <clears throat> The, the Chinese are a lot like the Chinese communists are a lot like the Wilhelmine Germans in the late 19th century. They behave in ways that guarantee that everybody else gets irritated. Uh, and so I think what, what he's facing is that <clears throat> the great gamble that they could become the dominant country in the world uh, is probably gonna fail. And in fact, as you know, they're on the edge of a demographic cliff that is unbelievable. They, they, there may be as few as 400 million Chinese at the end of the century, because the impact of the one child policy is so devastating that they're not they're going to have a very, after, after 2050, they have a very limited workforce. They have a very, very big uh, social burden of, of retired people. As, as somebody once said, the Japanese were clever enough to get rich before they got old. The Chinese are about to get old before they got rich. And I think this, this means that Xi Jinping has a very short time horizon uh, to have any hope of breaking free. Uh, and that uh, as we just saw with a speech by the leading general in Taipei to a conference in Australia, you have this network building of virtually everybody who doesn't want China to dominate. And I think that's probably been a surprise to the Chinese house how rapidly that's come together. And what would your recommendation or advice be uh, for the Biden administration to better uh, deter China? Uh, rebuild the American military very dramatically. Make sure that you can dominate in space, prepare to survive an electronic magnetic pulse attack, and prepare to dominate in cyber warfare. I mean, you, you first have to have the tools. It's not about dancing diplomatically. It's about having the sheer strength that by any reasonable standard, uh, the Chinese dictatorship will decide that it is impossible to take us on. What do you think the U.S. could do more to better uh, defend Taiwan's democracy? Well, I, I would say two things. I'd say, first of all, we should ensure that they have all of the sophisticated defensive weapons they need on such a scale that it would be practically impossible for the Chinese communists to invade them. And that's not that hard to do. And Admiral Stavridis, the uh, four-star admiral who, who was the head of NATO has, has written extensively on this. And I think it basically talks about make, turning them into a porcupine so that they're just too hard to swallow. But the other thing we ought to do is we ought to remember, we need, just as we had with the Soviets, we need a, a radio-free China. We need a communication. We need to communicate that we are not opposed to the Chinese people. The Chinese people have every right to pursue happiness. They have every right to be productive. They have every right to live in prosperity and in safety. Our, our problems are with the totalitarian dictatorship. And I think we should, we should have a much more robust uh, outreach uh, from programs like yours uh, to make sure that we are, we are communicating with the people of China, that there is a natural affinity 
between the American people and the Chinese people, and we should not let problems between our governments uh, be confused into problems between our two peoples. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for taking Thank my you. interview.